welcome to University Theatre's How To Theatre Series. My name is Laura Parker. I am the Costume Shop Manager and Costume Designer here at NC State. Behind the scenes where you can't see her, we have the lovely Adrienne McKenzie. Um, she's also going to be operating as my camera operator today. So three cheers for Ms. McKenzie here. We are going through Alteration Basics from a theatrical perspective which may look very, very different from alteration basics that you may do for your personal clothing or you may have done in a professional shop. The reason why there's a difference is that we are constantly using and reusing these costumes. So we wanna make sure that the alterations look really, really nice on stage, but we also wanna make sure that they are easy to take out so we can reuse these costumes for other actors. And we also wanna make sure that they are quick and effective and not too time consuming because if you're doing a show with a cast of 40 or 50 people, it can be really, really hard to get everything done. So we have some tips and tricks to kind of help you make these alterations really, really fast. So first thing we're gonna do is go through our tools. So if you think back to last week, if you're with us last week, we're going to use all of the basic tools that we went over there, but we're going to pull in some different ones too. So the first thing we're going to need is our flexible tape measure. This is going to be the tape measure that we can wrap around curved surfaces. This is going to help us get really, really accurate measurements across the body. And this is also going to help us get really, really accurate measurements across the garment. So we need our flexible tape measure. Next thing we're gonna use is a clear plastic ruler. This is a flexible but rigid ruler. And you can see how here it has inch markings going across and going down. So we've got these big lines that mark our inches. We've got our inches going down. We've got our half inch marks quarter inch marks, eighth inch marks, going all the way across. These tend to be 18 inch rulers. Some of them are a little longer, some a little shorter, but this can be a really, really handy tool to help us mark things like hems and make sure that we're getting really, really accurate measurements in places where we need it to be a little flexible, but we also need it to be very, very firm. And something that we can see through can be really, really helpful. So we use these um flexible clear rulers quite a bit next we're going to need talk to me our yardstick we do use the yardstick relatively frequently and um, this is a metal or this is a uh, wooden one you can get these just about anywhere we also have a metal one floating around but i couldn't find it the metal one's my favorite but basic good old yardstick we're going to need our marking tools. So we went over these last week. So just as a reminder, we have our chalk pencils. We have our standard pencil. We can also use that chalk that we talked about last week as well, the little block chalk. But these little chalk pencils really are our favorites in the shop because they are water soluble. They do wash out really, really easily. And the uh, good old number two pencil can be really, really handy for just really basic markings. All right. We've got our standard pins. And then we also have our safety pins. And these two different types of pins are going to be used for different applications while we're doing our alterations. So you're going to want to have a good choice of both of those. We're going to need our scissors, obviously. Um, Talia asks, what was the brand name on the water soluble pencil? Oh, okay, let me, uh, let me see. This is Clover. Let's see if I can, oh, it's backwards on the screen. <laughs> Sorry, it's a mirror image on the screen, but it is Clover. It is actually a Japanese brand pencil, but it's sold through Clover. And um, we get these through Waywalk, W-A-W-A-K. 
Um, I don't remember if they're sold at um, Joann's as well, but Waylock, uh, Adrian confirms they are sold at Joann's as well. But these are fantastic little pencils. They come in packs of three or four. I think you get, I think they're three. You get a pink one, a blue one, and a white one. So you, you have colors for just about any application. Brand on the ruler, um, Dritz. These particular rulers are Dritz's. Um, I think that's a pretty common brand for most of these kind of clear plastic rulers. If you go to your, um, Joann's is about the only local fabric store anymore. If you go to your Joann's, there's generally a big section for quilting. And that's where you can get stuff like these clear plastic rulers. It's usually kind of hidden away in the quilting section. All right. Seam rippers, seam ripper, seam ripper, seam ripper, seam ripper, seam ripper. These are definitely going to be a really, really handy tool for um, alterations because we are constantly taking things apart, putting them back together again. Of course, you're going to want to have your standard thread, your needles, um, thread that's going to be matching your project. That's going to be really, really important. So you want a variety of thread to work with hand sewing needles, machine needles, if you're doing machine alterations, that sort of thing. And then the last tool that I personally really, really, really love, and this may look a little silly, but work with me here, y'all, is gonna be these like 1960s, 1970s Singer Simplicity Better Homes and Gardens sewing books. These are like, Legit, my super, super favorite. There are a thousand sewing books out there. Um, there are plenty of ones that are modern and they're fabulous and they're really well written. But these good old fashioned ones, honestly, are gonna have just about everything that you need in them. Um, I'm gonna go back to the doc cam for a sec. Their diagrams tend to be very, very clear the instructions tend to be very, very clear as well. And they just have a lot of really, really great information about classic vintage sewing techniques that, that are timeless. These are techniques that we use today, even if we're doing modern clothing, but especially in theatrical costuming, if you're doing period pieces, these vintage sewing books can be really, really useful. And plus, they're cheap. You go on Amazon, you go on eBay, you go to your local used bookstore. You can get these for three bucks, five bucks. If you're lucky, you can get them from your very own mother. This is my mother's from the 1960s. So um, these can be really, really great tools to have in your toolbox if you need to um, answer any questions. I use these very, very frequently. Um, when I don't know how to do something. Because even if you've been doing this for 15 years, every once in a while you're like, I don't know how to do that. So you look it up in your book. So definitely have a good sewing manual at your side. All right, so those are the tools that I like to use. Anybody have any tool questions? Dara says she loves your mask. Oh, thanks Dara. <laughs> All right, so. We're going to move on to basic alterations. All right, so the first thing that we are going to do is go over some basic shirt alterations. So this is a standard um, dress shirt, button down dress shirt. And sometimes we need to, um, especially when we're working with stock, we're going to try to alter a shirt to make it a little larger or a little smaller to fit our actor so we don't have to buy a new shirt. The two basic alterations that we do on shirts tend to be either making the sleeves a little shorter so that it, the cuff lays at the right place on the wrist. And if there's too much bulk in the back and it's making the suit lie improperly, we might take a little tuck or a little dart here in the back. So when we're altering a shirt, First thing we want to do is put it on our actor. We're going to pretend this is our actor. 
We're going to put it on our actor inside out so that we can work from the inside. You want to get it on as cleanly as possible. And you're going to ask your actor to button themselves in so that the shirt lays on the body the way that you want it to lay. All right. So once our shirt is on our actor, to take in this bulk on the back, all we're going to do is we're going to add a little dart. And so you can see here, I've already sewn the dart in one side. And basically, that's just pulling in this excess fabric here. And it tends to show up in almost a little football shape on the body. So all we're going to do is use our standard pins or safety pins. And we're just going to pull that in so it lays nice and flat like that. Laura, there is a question for any kind of good seam rippers out there. The ones at the craft stores aren't that good. Do you have recommendations for good seam rippers? So yes, the ones at the craft stores are terrible. <laughs> Um, we really like the, um, the Clover brand, white handled seam rippers. You can buy them again through Waywalk, W-A-W-I-K. This is not a commercial for Waywalk, but <laughs> they are the, they're one of the major, um, one of the major professional sewing supply companies. You can purchase online from them. Um, you don't have to have a business or anything like that. Um, but that white handled Clover brand tends to have a really, really sharp blade to it. And they tend to last a little longer than the, um, the blue ones that you get at, at the craft stores. Mm -hmm. So that's my personal favorite. Do you have a different favorite, Adrian? Oh, no, I find those ones in the shop are really the good ones to okay. use. I mean, <laughs> if you wanted to, I know some folks who have like special commissioned um, Damascus steel, seam rippers from blacksmiths that will cost you an arm and a leg, but they do tend to last really long and they can be really, really great. But I like the clothing. All right, so all we're doing is pinning that little dart into place. And what we want to do is make sure that we've got the largest point of the dart kind of in the center here, and then we're radiating out, radiating out to the points on either end. So we have that marked here. The next thing we want to do is we want to measure the length of the um, sleeve and see how much shorter we have to make it. So we're going to pretend there's an arm in here, and we're going to pretend that we need to make this sleeve about an inch shorter. So when it's on our actor, we're just going to go ahead and pinch again on the inside of that sleeve. We're going to pinch about an inch and mark that in place. And this we would do with safety pins with the um, actual actors so that we don't cook them. But here we're going to use standard pins just because it's a little easier. So we know that we have to make this about an inch shorter. So once the actor goes away, we're going to go ahead and mark this and sew it. So we're going to flip back over to our document camera here. All right, here we can see we've got <clears throat> our, see, our pins right where that dart wants to be. We're going to go ahead and mark this using our little pencils, making sure that's marked nice and evil, evenly. I like to mark right on top of where those pins are lying so that we know that our stitch line is going to go exactly where we had um, where we pinned it on the body. And then we're going to flip it over and we're going to do, do the same thing on the back. We're going to get as close to those pins as possible. Once we have it marked, now we can take those pins out.
And we're going to lay the garment flat on our workspace. Here we can see this is where our pins were. And we can go back in and kind of fill in the blanks. We'll just even this out a little bit. And if I hadn't already done the, um, the first one, I would make sure that my darts were evenly spaced across the body, across the back of the shirt to make sure that they were symmetrical. Ooh, there we go. So you wanna make sure that, <clears throat> that your darts are equidistant from your side seams and that they're spaced out appropriately across the center back as well, just so it looks symmetrical. And then you go ahead and taper down to the point at the bottom and taper up to the point at the top. And a lot of this can be, you can, you can be very, very specific about measuring. You wanna to try to make sure that the width of your dart is about the same on both your left dart. Oops, there we go. There we go. Your left dart and your right dart, you wanna make sure that they are about the same size. So you can use your, this is where your clear plastic ruler comes in handy. You can measure that broadest point of your dart. Make sure those are equidistant. And once your darts look symmetrical and they're placed appropriately, then you're going to go back in. You're going to fold your fabric in half. You want to make sure that the grain line of that fabric is pretty straight there. So the center fold is going to be right on that grain of the fabric. And then you're going to repin your dart, oops, matching up those stitch lines that you just drew in. So you're going to try to pin this nice and evenly all the way up the dart before you sew it. Like so. So the trick with putting these darts in place is that you want to make sure that they're symmetrical. You want to make sure that they are spaced evenly and that they are about the same size so that when the garment lies on the body, um, one side isn't going to look bunchier or is going to um, hang differently than the other side. Oops, there we go. Like so. So once you have your dart pinned into place. Remember, you're going to do this on the inside of the garment. So we want this little flappy flap thing to be on the inside of the garment. All you're going to do is sew that into place like we've done on this side here. And then you're going to give it a good press with an iron that is at an appropriate heat and either use steam or not steam as is appropriate for your fabric. Personally, I like to um, press the darts towards the side seam. I think that lays a little prettier, but um, some folks like to press towards the center. It's more of a personal preference. So that is darts. That's gonna help you pull in any um, excess fabric that is um, not laying really nicely on your after. So the other thing that we did on the shirt is we marked how much shorter we want our sleeve to be. So here's our cuff. This is about the center of the sleeve. This up here, this is where our arm side is. So once we've kind of marked that, then we can take that out and mark around the circumference of the sleeve, that one inch that we know that we need to pull that sleeve up. So we know we need to pull this up one inch. For this, we want our tuck to be on the inside of the sleeve. For some um, garments, you can actually put the tuck on the outside of the sleeve. Um, I tend to do that for period pieces, for oldie tiny shows. Um, we do a lot of oldie tiny shows. Um, just because it adds a little bit of texture 
and a little bit of visual interest. But for something like a standard um, dress shirt that goes under a suit, putting the tuck on the inside is gonna help that suit sleeve lay a little nicer. Um, typically, if we're doing, um, we will only do tucks on dress shirts that go under suits if we know that the actor is not taking the suit jacket off on stage. And because it does create a, um, let's see if I can showcase the other one that I've done. So this is a finished tuck on the opposite sleeve. You can see it creates this little fold of fabric. That's on the inside. And then on the outside of the sleeve, it does create a little seam, a little stitch line, a little fold here that you can see on stage. So if the actor is taking off their jacket, this is gonna be pretty unsightly. So we want, so this is not something that we would do for that. We would either have to find an alternative shirt or we could take up the, um, take up the excess length by removing the cuff, snipping off that excess length and then reattaching the cuff. But doing the tuck is a really, really quick and easy way to shorten it as long as the actor is keeping their suit jacket on. So, once we've marked where we want that tuck to go, all we're gonna do is we're going to take that sleeve, turn it inside of itself like this, so, and then fold it so that the center in between our two stitch lines, so we got stitch line, stitch line, that center is going to be on our fold. And we are going to very carefully match up our two pink stitch lines and pin that in place. Like so. And I tend to do these about at the center point of the sleeve um, maybe a little bit above or a little bit below the, um, the elbow bend because sleeves do taper. So if you, um, if you do it too far up on the sleeve or too far down on the sleeve, your tuck is going to get kind of bunchy and it's going to look kind of funny and that may affect how the um, suit jacket hangs. So you want to get it at the place on the sleeve where it's going to hang nice and smoothly. You want it to take, to take up as much, as little bulk as possible. So basically, all you're gonna do is you're gonna go around that whole sleeve, pinning in place, matching up your stitch lines, and then you're going to insert that sleeve into the arm of the sewing machine and sew straight around that. Once you've got that sewn straight around, you can take out your pins and you have your finished tuck like this. So that is a really quick and easy alteration that can help a suit look really professional and look really, really well fit on an actor with very, very, very little work and using what you have in stock. So this is really one of our favorite alterations. We do this literally on almost every show. Adrian is nodding in agreement. All right, so those are the two basic alterations that we do on shirts. Does anybody have any shirt questions? Talia is asking, is flappy flap a technical term? <laughs> flappy flap is a Laura Parker technical term. Probably not an industry technical term. <laughs> All right, so that is shirts. Next, we are going to move on to dress alterations. So we're gonna switch over back to our dress form cam here. So one of the, <clears throat> one of the other really big alterations that we do is, um, again, if we're working on stock, if we're working out of stuff that we have, we may have a dress that we wanna use on an actor that is a little too big and we want to fit it to them. So you can see this dress is pretty loose around the waist on this particular 
dress form slash actor. So what we're going to do is we're going to put some more darts, just like we did on the back of that dress shirt, onto this particular um, garment. And so what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're doing that pretty evenly. Um, another thing that you could do is we could take it in on the sides. So this particular dress has a side zipper, and I don't want to reach up that zipper. That's going to be a pain in the butt. So we're going to do darts. That's going to help us really reset this. So since this is a dress that we made in shop, I know that the skirt is attached to the bodice just by gathering right there. So this is going to be a really easy one for us to alter. So what we're going to do is when the, um, when the dress is on the actor, we're going to use our safety pins. And all we're going to do is we're going to mark where those darts want to go to get us a nice smooth fit on the bodice. And we're going to mark those with our safety pin. And we're trying to keep this again, just like with the shirt, trying to keep this nice and even. Like so. So I tend to do both darts at the same time and really kind of feel and work their way up so we can get them as evenly as possible on the actor and not have to do too much alteration or too much math, frankly, once we get it off the body. So that's what we're going to do. And a lot, of, a lot of the judgment about kind of how far to move the darts up, um, how much to take it in, is going to come down to personal preference. It's going to come down to your artistic judgment. It's going to come down to your understanding of the time period that you're working in. And the other big thing that you want to take into consideration is actor comfort. And also, if it's a musical, whether or not they're wearing a mic pack. Because those mic packs are really big and really bulky and they can take up a lot of space. So we want to make sure that when we're fitting, especially for musicals, we know where the actor is going to be wearing their mic pack and how we can fit around that. So we've got a pretty nice fit there on the back. We're going to pull her around there in the front. And we're going to do couple little little darts here right at the bust line. Like so. And so one of the one of the things that we need to be careful, we need to be cognizant cognizant about as we're fitting on actors is as we're getting closer to um, to personal areas that we're just making sure that we're talking through, we're communicating, and we're making sure that the actor knows where our hands are going and making sure that the actor is comfortable. It should be a conversation. And if the actor is not comfortable, we can direct the actor to do the pinning on themselves, as opposed to having us doing the pinning for them. So we always want to make sure that we're touching base with our actors and making sure that we're respecting um, respecting them as human beings. So there we go. So now we've got our darts in place. So what we would do next, we would take this off the dress one. There we go. We're going to go back over to our document camera here, and you can see we've got our darts marked out with our safety pins. This is going to be where we're going to flip the garment inside out, like so. And here, I'm going to use my, haha, 
I'm going to use my blue pencil here and you can give your give your garment just a little bit of tug make sure that you're getting right where that pin is and you can mark exactly where that dart needs to go internally on the garment before we pull out those safety pins. So I'm feeling with my fingers right where those safety pins are, marking appropriately. And I wanna do that before I remove the safety pins. Then I can go in, remove my safety pins, And it's kind of hard to see on this pink fabric, but you can see this is where my dart needs to go. And again, we're going to maintain that kind of football shape. So we're going to go directly up the center, find a natural point, and put that dart into place like that. And just like with our dress shirt, we're going to do the same thing on our other dart here. We're going to check our distances, make sure the darts are about the same width, make sure they're about the same distance away from our, oops, from our side seams here. You just make sure that they're spaced evenly across the back of this bodice. Now for this particular garment, since this has a really, really heavily gathered skirt here. We could theoretically just pin this in place and kind of ease the dart down into the skirt without removing the skirt. But since this one has a really, really heavy gather on the skirt, what I would do is remove the skirt right at that dart, at that dart point. You don't have to take off the entire skirt. Just remove it right at that dart point using your seam ripper, sew your dart into place, and then regather your skirt right at that section and just sew it right back on. And that's gonna give you a really nice, clean, professional finish on this alteration. And that's something that you'll be able to take out and use again for other actors. Some dresses you can't do that um, based on their construction. So you just kind of need to use your best judgment about how to best deconstruct the dress in order to make sure that your um, alteration looks clean and professional. But when we're building garments in our shop, we're always taking into consideration um, the fact that we will have to alter these things in the future. So we use garment construction techniques that are going to make it easier for us to alter these things for future actors, which is why this particular garment was built the way that it was built. So that is a really quick and easy dress alteration that's going to help you resize this for a variety of sized actors. Next, we're going to go on to hemming. Hemming is like 85% of what we do. All right, that's like probably not really scientific, but we do a lot of hemming in here. Again, because we're building garments that are being used and reused. And so we wanna make sure that we're building them so that we can hem them for a variety of heights of actors. So I'm gonna go over how to do, how to mark a skirt hem, and then all of the different ways that you can hem a skirt depending on the shape of the skirt. And depending on the material. So we're going to go back over to Dress Form Cam. Bill Saunders says, this is where Laura shows us the hemming way. <laughs> yes, it is. All right, I need my yardstick. So for hemming, you're going to want either your yardstick or your clear plastic ruler. But you're going to want a ruler that is rigid. All right, so we're going to use this particular dress right here. And I'm going to get down on the ground. 
<laughs> like so. All right, so when we're having a skirt, when we're having a dress, we want to make sure that the actor is wearing all of the undergarments that they will be wearing when they are actually wearing the costume. Because the shape of the undergarments can affect how the skirt, how the dress hangs on the body. The other thing we want to be sure about is that the actor is wearing the shoes that they're going to be wearing on stage. Because the height of the heel is going to affect how the body fits and how the skirt or how the dress hangs on the body as well. So you want to make sure they're wearing all the things that they're going to be wearing when you mark this hem. And we usually do that at the final fitting when we have everything else in place. Um, part of the other thing that we need to take into consideration with hemming is how long or how short should the garment be. Um, when we're doing period pieces, if we're doing a full length skirt, it's not actually going to be a floor length skirt. The skirt of the, or the bottom of the skirt should not be touching the floor because that's going to be a tripping hazard for your actor. Typically, we're going to hem our floor length skirt anywhere between two and three inches above the floor when they are in their shoes. That typically is going to be long enough that from stage it looks like a full length skirt, but it's still giving the actor enough clearance that they can walk around and be safe and comfortable. Um, if it's something like a 1920s, 30s, 40s show, something um, kind of mid century like that. We tend to have our skirts so that they are all the same height across the board, no matter what height the actor is. So we'll make a note at the first fitting, okay, we need all of our skirts to be 16 inches above the floor. And what that does is, um, A, with, um, <laughs> with period styles and period fashions, skirt height with a component of that fashion. So skirt heights in the 1930s are going to be a little longer than skirt heights in the 1940s. Um, and that was just a fashion choice. But from a theatrical perspective, it also provides a uniformity across the stage and it creates a more cohesive stage picture. So you don't have one actor whose skirt is significantly shorter than the other. That can be really distracting. So we try to keep our skirt heights about, about the same. Um, sometimes you have to fudge a little if you have one actor who is significantly taller and one actor who is significantly shorter. You kind of play with those a little bit, but for the most part, you try to keep them at about the same height from the ground to the hem of the skirt. So how you mark the hem is really kind of a personal preference. Some people use those little, um, they call them poofers. <laughs> I hate the poofers, but their little, their little machine has a little poofer ball with some chalk in it. And you set the height and you squeeze the little poofer ball and make a little line of chalk around your skirt. I personally don't like that because the chalk tends to rub off very, very quickly. Um, so if you're coming right away, that can be a very quick and easy way to do it. Here in the costume shop, we tend to mark the hems. They go back on the racks and they may not be looked at again for another week and a half. By then, the poof would have poofed off. So the way that we do it in here, so it's permanent, is we're going to be using our clear press ruler or our yardstick, kind of depending on how far we need to go. And we're going to be using our safety pin. So we're going to pretend that this is on a real human being. This real human being has their shoes on, they have their undergarments on. And we're going to ask for a real human being to stand up straight and don't look down. They always look down. <laughs> we always tell them that there's nothing exciting happening down there. Um, but the reason why we want them to not look down is when you're looking down, you can see what that's already doing to my shoulders is that's going to pull my shoulders forward, which is going to pull my back up, which means that the back of the skirt and the front of the skirt are going to be kind of catacombers. So we want this to be as straight as possible 
when somebody is standing at kind of a resting posture. So stand up straight, don't look down. We're going to take our hard plastic ruler here. We're going to hold that directly on the floor like that. And we're going to say we want this skirt to be uh, 12 inches above the ground. So we've got our 12 inch mark here. And all we're going to do is use our safety pins and go all the way around our skirt, like so. And so the trick with marking hands is just remembering that everybody is beautiful and everybody is shaped differently. So depending on where a person has curves versus where a person may be a little straighter, the rise of the hem is going to change as it moves around the skirt. So when you get this skirt off of the body, as long as you have been really, really careful about keeping the base of the ruler nice and flat and pinning appropriately, your skirt hem should hang nice and straight once the hem has been put in place. Sometimes that means that your hemline may, may look wavy, it may look curvy, it may have an angle, and may move around a little bit, but that's okay because human bodies are curvy and human bodies have angles and human bodies move around a little bit. So we're going to trust that our pinning is appropriate and we're going to trust that we have done our job here appropriately. So I'm not going to go all the way around the skirt because even though this is a relatively smaller circumference period skirt, period skirts are also really huge. But you can see how this does actually go pretty quickly once you get into the rhythm of it. Um, I tend to go every, I don't even know what that is, every four or five inches, like so. You can go a little closer if you're building up confidence. I wouldn't go any further apart though, because then you lose that curve um, as you work your way around the body. So that is just marking the hem. And what's great about using the safety <clears throat> about using the safety pin method is that we can, we can put the skirt on a rack, let it sit there for a week, let it sit there for two weeks, and these marks are not going to go anywhere. If we mark this with chalk, if we mark this with those little coosters, those are those would rub off and we lose our markings. So this just ensures that we don't lose the work that we have done. All right, any questions about marking the hem? Yes, we love body positivity, says Emma. Woohoo! <laughs> Me too. Me too. All right, so I'm gonna go. So now, got this lovely festive um, Halloween fabric because Halloween is coming up. So now we're gonna pretend that this is our marked hem. So, this is the front of our fabric. This is the back or the inside of our garment. I like to mark on the front of the fabric. I'm going to show you why here in just a second. So what we're going to do is same thing as when we were marking our darts. We want to make sure that our pins are laying nice and flat. Let me zoom in a little more without destroying this. And I'm going to use my pencil. Aha. Uh -huh. And I'm going to mark right on top of those pins, right where the pin is going through the fabric. I'm going to mark right on top. You always want to test your marking pencil on your fabric, um, especially if you're using a delicate fabric. Um, you just want to make sure that the pencil is not going to permanently mark, but most of the time it doesn't. And then you can go ahead and take out your pins. So now we have this boop, 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 
Here we go. Now we have this chalk dotted line. Now I'm going to go through. Hope y'all can see this. I'm trying to mark very clearly. And I just broke my pencil. We're going to switch to pink. And I broke the pink one. We're going to switch to pencil. <laughs> there we go. That's okay, Adrian. I got a pencil. Thank you. So we're going to mark, fill in that dotted line like so. So you can see, even though my skirt, kind of the bottom of my skirt here is a nice straight line, my hem is a little curvy. And that's okay because bodies are curvy and we're going to trust our pinning. So once we have that marked in place, now I'm going to flip it over or flip the garment inside out. And I'm going to fold. You can see here's my line right here. I'm going to fold directly on that line and then use my standard pins to pin that hem in place like so. And from there, you can hem the skirt in whatever method is appropriate for your project, appropriate for your fabric. Um, and the type, of, the type of hemming that you choose to use really is going to vary depending on what you're working on, um, what the fabric is. More delicate fabrics may require a more delicate hemming method. Um, you may want to use a hand method versus a machine method. Um, it just, it really depends on what your fabric wants to do. So you can see because this has a little bit of a curve on it, it's not laying perfectly flat here. It's flat enough, but what I would do before I started hemming it is I would actually put this under the iron and give it a nice press and just make sure that this hem is going to sit nice and flat up against the um, up against the body of the skirt, like that. So when we're marking hems for so when we're marking hems for stage work, typically we're going to try to mark a pretty wide hem. Again, that's because we're using these garments over and over and over again. So we want to make sure we're giving us enough kind of wiggle room so that if um, somebody four inches taller than the first actor who wore it needs to wear this garment, we can let that hem down as much as possible. And sometimes we can't. Sometimes there's such a drastic height difference between the original person who wore it and then the next person who wears it that we don't have enough hem to kind of let down. And we're going to show you some tricks on how to fix that. So, but this is going to be your standard hem. So once you have your hem in place, we can, we can sew that hem in a couple of different ways. Um, last week we went over our cross stitch. This is going to be a really, really simple, a really pretty, a really sturdy hand stitch that's going to be very, very invisible from the back side. So we're going to use this primarily for very delicate fabrics. If you're working with silks, if you're working with chiffons, anything that's kind of light and wispy that you don't want a heavy machine hem, this is going to be a really, really good hem for that. Another, another option is going to be legit just turning and stitching. So you can turn your fabric just like we did with our little ghosts and then use your machine stitch and then just do a standard machine stitch going all the way across just like that. And if it is a solid colored fabric, if you're working with like a cotton or a linen, um, something that doesn't have too much squish in it, um, I wouldn't do it with a squishy sort of wool because then you're going to really see that indentation. But like a cotton broadcloth or a linen, if, you're, if your thread matches the fabric really, really nicely, this is perfectly appropriate for stage work. This is actually going to blend in really, really nicely. Nobody's going to see that. 
if you are worried that your um, machine hem is actually going to be seen from stage, you can do a blind hem on the machine. And this is a specialized stitch that is on most domestic sewing machines. And basically, what you do is you've got your, <clears throat> you've got your um, hem folded back, and you're gonna flip that like this and run it through the machine so that the blind hem stitch is doing your standard stitch to the right of your little fold back, but then it's doing this little catch stitch right into the fold. And it's doing that every three quarters of an inch or so. And what that does is that mimics a hand done blind hem, but it does it very, very quickly and very, very efficiently. So it looks like this on the back side of your project. But when you flip it over, you've just got these little print pin pricks going across the front of your project. And again, if this thread was a matching thread, I use contrasting threads with a C. But if this is a matching thread, this is not going to be visible from stage at all. So this can be a very, very quick, easy way to get an almost invisible hem for um, theatrical or for personal work. Now, all of these examples that I've been showing you, we've gone ahead and used a surged edge. We've done an overlocked surge on our hems to protect that seam. So a serger is a specialized sewing machine that creates this overlock here. It's cutting your fabric and it's encasing it in this, um, in this stitch, in this thread. If you don't have access to a serger, we still want to make sure that that raw edge <clears throat> is, um, is protected because this raw edge, if it's not protected, it's eventually going to unravel, it's going to pull out, it's going to look unsightly, and, um, and it could eventually make your hem fall out. So we can use something called um, hem tape, um, another brand name is, <clears throat> excuse me, another brand name is Snug Hug, um, but it is a very, very thin, lightweight nylon tape that you're actually going to sew on the bottom edge of your fabric on the right side of your fabric. And then that gets flipped up on the inside like that. And you can do your cross stitch, you can do a whip stitch, you could, um, you could do just your straight stitch across the top there, but that's giving your fabric, that's giving your hem just a little bit of extra protection so that raw edge is going to be on the inside of your fabric. So I really like using that. Um, Talia asked, does your hem tape also come from Waywalk? Yes, yes, you can get it from Waywalk. And I can't remember if Waywalk has the, um, uses the Snug Hug brand name or if they just call it hem tape. You can buy it at Joann's in little packages um, in the same section where they sell the bias tape. You can also buy seam binding, hem tape um, in that section as well. All right, so Bill was asking, what do you do if your hem has a curve or if it's, um, or if it's not a straight hem like we've been working with here? So I have this example. So this is an example of a curved hem. You see this typically on a circle skirt. Um, you see very, very curved hems on, um, on things like um, period skirts and that sort of thing. So what I like to do is first go in and mark your hem on that front side like so. So you've got that hem marked in place. And then I'm actually gonna go in and with my, um, with my sewing machine, I'm gonna sew directly on top of that hemline and use that as a guideline as I'm turning this curved hem. Um, by sewing that little guideline there, it not only gives me a very visible 
guide on both sides without having to double mark it. It also actually acts as a um, as a barrier. It acts as, as a natural stay for as we're folding back that curve. So that that just that simple line of stitching is going to help us maintain that curve as we're working our way around the circular hem, like so. So in the case where we have a circular hem, sometimes if the circle is really, really tight, you can see here, we're folding it back, but we've got this blurb right here. We've got this, this little blurb that is not, it's not sitting flat for lever money. It's just not gonna do it. So all we're gonna do here is we're just going to do a little tuck right there. We're just gonna fold that into place like so. Laura, Judy asks when doing that implementation of the stitch, is mm -hmm. it a normal stitch length or longer basting length? Um, I do a normal stitch length. Um, I tend to match the thread. So I'm not even pulling this thread out. It's gonna stay there forever. And if the thread matches close enough, Nobody's going to see it. <laughs> if, um, if your fabric is delicate or if you don't have thread that matches really well, you can do it a basting length and do it as a contrasting thread and take it out if you wanted to, but I typically do not have the patience for that. <laughs> so here we've got our curve and we're just going to fold that over and pin in place. And so you can see as, as we're following this curve here, this is not gonna lay flat. So we're going to put a little tuck and we're going to pin that little tuck in place. And by doing those little tucks going around the circle, um, you can get a nice flat hem. The other option, um, which I typically do not do just for time's sake, um, because circle skirts tend to be really big, but the other option is that you could actually do a, um, a gathering or a basting stitch along this top edge here and very gently pull that and ease that hem into place so that it sits nice and flat. Once you press that down, that would, set, that would sit really, really nicely. That's going to be a more couture way to do it. Um, it's going to be a little more of a finished way to do it. But for theatrical purposes, this typically works just fine, just by doing these little tucks. But if you have a more delicate fabric, again, if you're working with like a silk or a chiffon, you may want to do that, um, that gathering stitch, that basting stitch around the top and ease that hem into place, like so. All right, so moving on to um, oh, the one last the one last kind of trick that we like to use to um, shorten skirts. We do this a lot for period pieces, for old timey pieces. Um, if you have a skirt in um, in a period piece for kind of a middle class or a lower class character, and you want to take it up very very easily, you can actually do that same tuck method that we did on these shirts. And you can do that on the inside or the outside of the garment. I like to actually do it on the outside for these period pieces because it, again, it just adds a really, really pretty piece of texture to the garment. And any more texture that we can get on these garments is gonna add visual interest to the costume design as a whole. It's just gonna make our design look a little more layered, a little more interesting, a little more visually appealing. So the tucks can be a really, really easy way to take up these skirts, make them shorter, while also um, creating visual interest. So that's adding a little tuck to this very tiny little skirt. Tiny little skirt. All right, so next we're gonna go over how to make a skirt longer if the skirt is too short. So if you made a skirt for an actor who is five, six or five, seven, and you want to put that actor, that skirt of an actor who is 
5'10 or 5'11, you're not going to have enough hem in there. Nobody's going to leave that much hem. But we have options. So I'm going to. So the first thing you can do is we can simply add a ruffle onto the bottom of the skirt. If you have the same fabric, if you have some scraps left over, you can add a ruffle in the same exact fabric. Um, I put a little piece of ribbon here to kind of add a little visual interest to make it look, um, to make it look like it was intentional. But um, if you don't have matching fabric, you can do it with contrasting fabric as well. It can be really pretty interesting design choice as well. So adding a ruffle is always an option. And one of the other things I do very, very frequently is adding a band on the bottom of the skirt. So this particular skirt was too short for our actor. So we went ahead and added on this band at the bottom to lengthen the skirt. And it also adds a really pretty visual interest. So that gold band is pulling out these little gold dots in this blue brocade. And it looks really, really pretty on stage when the actor moves. You can see how that really makes the um, skirt movement pop there. So we're going to go over how to do these two um, alterations here real quick. So the first one, the ruffle, is pretty easy. So this is our ruffle example. This is our finished example. And here we have our skirt fabric. We have our ruffle. And you can see how we just gathered the ruffle onto the back and sewed it in place. Typically, you're going to press that hem up into the body of the skirt. You press it down like this. It's going gonna, it's gonna to have too much bulk down here in the ruffle. And you also run the risk of squishing your puppy little ruffles. We want our ruffles to stay nice and puppy. So for that, all you're going to do, you've got your skirt fabric here. Cut a band to make your ruffle out of. And the length of the band is going to depend on how dense you want your ruffle to be. Um, there's math you can do. I tend to just kind of eyeball experiment it, experiment with it. Um, but basically, the longer the ruffle or the longer the band, the more dense your ruffle is going to be. So you find the density that works really well for you. I tend to like a really fluffy ruffle. And here you're going to put your gathering stitches into place. So when I'm doing gathering stitches, let's see if I can make this. All right. So when I'm doing gathering stitches, we're going to lock our um, lock our threads at the front of our project when we begin our project. Make sure they're locked in place really good. And I'm always going to do two rows of gathering stitches. You can do just one. But your gathers tend to, um, they tend to be a little unwieldy and they don't lie as pretty, they don't lie as um, evenly as if you do two rows of gathering stitches. So I'm going to lock in place, set my stitch length all the way down to the, the longest, the widest stitch length that you have on your sewing machine. I'm going to stitch all the way down to the bottom and then to gather it, I'm going to pull the top two threads. So I've got two rows of stitches. I've got two threads here on the top. I've got my bobbin threads just hanging on the bottom. We're just going to let those little friends hang out there. I'm going to hold on to my gathering stitches. And I'm not going to pull the threads themselves. If you pull the threads, you run the risk of breaking your gathering stitches. And then you're going to get frustrated because you're going to have to do it all over again. And it's really irritating. So instead of pulling your threads, 
you're going to hold on to your, your threads pretty firmly. I tend to wrap them around my fingers so they don't go anywhere. I'm going to work my fabric down the threads like that. Talia asks, do you have a recommended ruffle ratio range? Um, if you want a really um, light ruffle, um, a one to two ratio. So um, if, your, if your garment is 10 inches in length, uh, if you do a 20 inch ruffle, that's going to give you a really light ruffle. Um, a three to one is going to give you kind of a, a mid range and a four to one is going to give you a pretty tight fluffy ruffle. Ooh, I lost my focus here. There we go. Claire Hume says, I have to drop out early, but that was another great session and so well done. Oh, thanks, Claire. It's good to see you. Thanks for joining us. All right. So once you've got your ruffle gathered up, you want to make sure it's gathered pretty evenly. And then to sew this in place, you're going to pop it on the bottom make your little fabric sandwich right side to right side. So the bright side of your fabric facing the bright side of your fabric. You want to even out your ruffle across the project. And then you're going to pin it in place. And when you're pinning it in place, I tend to really try to pull and even out these ruffles as I go, make sure that it's laying as flat as possible before you run it through the sewing machine. I'm going to pin in between these two stitching lines and that's going to help me control the ruffle as well. And you want to line up your edges as close as possible. So again, when we're adding length onto a skirt or onto a dress, to, um, to make it longer for an actor. I'm still not gonna finish the hem until we get this back on the actor. So we wanna make sure that we're cutting our ruffle or we're cutting our band with enough seam allowance or enough um, extra length on the bottom so that we can fold back that hem after we mark it. So we're gonna get that pinned in place. I did not get I did not gather that enough. And once it is pinned in place, all you're going to do is sew that straight down the middle of your two gathering lines. And so since we're sewing straight down the middle, that's again going to allow us to give it a little tug on our ruffles and make sure that these gathers are standing nice and straight so that they lay nice and pretty. If your gathers are kind of standing awkwardly spaced or if they're leaning or if they're just not tidy, your final ruffle is going to look a little wonky. So you want your gathers to be as straight up and down as possible like that. And then once you have that in place, we've got that sewn. Then you can go ahead and take out that bottom layer of gathering stitches that's underneath your stitch line so that, you know, so we don't see that anymore. We don't need those anymore. I'm typically actually going to leave the gathering stitches that are above our stitch line. You can take them out, but I just don't really find that it's really necessary. It actually kind of helps keep these gathers above our stitch line controlled. And then when you iron it, you're going to iron from the back side and you're only going to iron above that stitch line. If you iron below that stitch line, you're going to press down on these pretty, pretty, pretty ruffles that you just made and they're not going to be fluffy and everybody likes fluffy ruffles. So, so that, that is a really easy way to add some visual interest and to lengthen a skirt.
So the next thing we're going to go over is how to add that band on the bottom of the skirt. So here is my example here. And this one I did as a circle skirt. So you can see this is my teeny tiny little miniature circle skirt. Um, this is a little half circle here that we're pretending is a circle skirt. And so the reason why I chose to do a circle skirt is because with this bloop, bloop, with this curved edge, that's going to take a little bit of an extra step, a little bit of extra work. Oh, I've got 10 minutes. Oh my gosh, y'all, I have so much more to talk about. Um, <laughs> alterations, y'all. Um, so, so yeah, so that curved edge is going to, is going to offer a little bit of an extra challenge because as we work our way around that curved edge, if we cut our band just straight across the fabric from selvage to selvage, that band is not going to have any stretch to it. It's not going to have any ability to really work its way around this curve. And so it's going to get bunchy and it's not going to lay nice and flat like we want it to. So when we're, when we're putting bands on skirts that have a curve on it, like a circle skirt or a lot of our Edwardian, a lot of our Victorian skirts also have curved edges, we actually want to cut that band on what's called the bias. So the bias is going to be cut on the diagonal across the fabric as opposed to straight across the fabric. So you're going to be cutting your strips at this 45 degree angle. And what that does, if we look at this piece of fabric was cut on, on the straight, on the grain, if I pull on that, it's not going anywhere. It's pretty sturdy. It doesn't have any flexibility to it. It doesn't have any stretch to it. This green fabric that I'm using to, um, to edge our orange skirt, this was cut on the bias. This was actually cut on that 45 degree angle and that, if I pull on that, you can see how much stretch that has. It has a lot of stretch to it. And it's gonna be really flexible as we work our way around our skirt. So I'm gonna go through this real quick and then leave a little bit of time for Q&A here. So all we're gonna do is right side to right side, we're going to pin our bias strip to the bottom edge of our curve and work our way around. And you can see as I'm working around this curved edge, having that little bit of extra stretch is really, really, really helpful. It's going to give this a really, really pretty finished edge. Like so. <clears throat> Boom. So we're going to pretend that we did that all the way around, but you can see how that bias edge really, really makes putting this band on the bottom of a curve super, super, super easy. Whereas if I were to try to take my straight fabric cut on the grain. That's just not, that's just not even, it's just not going to do a thing. It's just going to irritate you. It's not going to lay flat. It's not going to lay pretty. So if your skirt has a really, really, um, kind of a, if it's a really sharp, narrow, I don't know. If the curve is really tight, there we go. If the curve is really tight, you may have to clip into your seam here to get it to lay flat, even when you're using this bias edging. And that's going to help it lay nice and flat once you iron it, it, iron it into place. Curves can be really, really tricky um, because you do have to use this bias edging. You do have to take a little care in clipping into your seam allowance to make sure that this is going to lay nice and flat. And you do have to give it 
a lot of extra steam. You have to press it really, really well. But once you kind of have it trained into place, it's going to offer you just a really, really beautiful finished edge here. Um, it's, it really is one of my favorite methods in adding length to a skirt or just using it as a design choice. Um, we do this quite a bit just for um, visual interest when we're doing circle skirts or period skirts. Are there any questions? What's a flounce? Is it different from a ruffle? I hear my aunt talking about flounces, but didn't know what the difference is. This is Scott. Scott, that's a really good question. Um, I personally think of a flounce as a ruffle. Um, I believe it is just an older term for ruffle at the bottom of something, like at the bottom of the skirt, um, on the hem of a sleeve. Um, but honestly, I don't know if that is a thousand percent accurate. So let me look that up and I will get back to you. Okay, if you're saying thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, I know that Tuesday afternoon can be really busy and we're super glad that you chose to spend time with us today. Um, don't forget to check out our website, theater.arts.nzstate.edu for all of the offerings that we have this semester. And we hope that we will see you again next week.